So this is a t-test calculator. It's really simple. Statistics. We're just going to enter standard deviation and mean. So this is going to be the drug group. And this is going to be control. And we're going to say that the survival is eight months for drug, six months for control. The standard deviation was six months. And what's 127 divided by um, two? Around 62 and a half. So, or wait, 63 and a half. But let's, let's just say it's 60 patients each because you throw some patients out. And if we calculate this, the p-value is 0.07, which is a failure. So maybe that, maybe that standard deviation is a little too high. Let's just say it's three months. Okay, now we got it. The p-value worked. So that's the kind of thin margins we have here. It's not really easy to figure out um, just how good a drug has to be. So like... At seven and a half months, it, it barely meets the p-value, and at seven months, it doesn't. So seven versus six is not enough. It has to be like eight versus six, which is a lot. And that's hard to do, because these patients, as I showed in my drawing, they're really, really sick. They're, they're, they're almost certainly going to die no matter what. You know, they, they, they're on their last breath, basically. Chemo worked, then it didn't. Cancer came back. It usually comes back stronger. In a way, and then chemo worked again, and it's probably going to come back stronger. So it's really hard to change that. Yeah, great. I can I can talk about p-value a little bit more. Um, let me see if I can get you a good good picture. So whenever you're doing a uh, whenever you're examining a clinical trial. Yeah, maybe this this is a good one. Let's see. There has to be a primary endpoint, one test that that is done first. Um, and that one test is um, going to use the alpha in the testing hierarchy. It's pretty complicated, I guess, but in statistics, it's thought that it's generally accepted by all scientists and statisticians. There's my poor example of an alpha. It's probably a little more dense like that. Um, and there's beta as well. But the amount of alpha spend or power you have in science is generally 0.05. And what does this mean? This is 5%, in other words. You have a hypothesis. This is a null hypothesis. This is that the drug doesn't work in most biopharma studies. Um, your alternative hypothesis could be this, that the sample is higher um, than some value, that the blue is what's observed. And what you're trying to figure out is what is the probability that my observation supports either hypothesis? When can I reject the null hypothesis and with what amount of certainty? This is the amount of certainty you need. If you needed, let's just cross this out for a second. If you needed this much certainty, would it be harder or easier to reject the null hypothesis? Anybody in chat know? If I, if I lowered this from five to one, It's way harder. It's way harder because I'm basically saying that I'm looking at the result and I'm saying, let's say drug versus control. The drug is seven months of survival and the control is seven months of survival. My hypothesis my null hypothesis is that these are not any different. The drug and control group will not have any result. This is before the trial is done. Now the trial is done, and these are the results. Seven months, seven months. It certainly looks like it, right? But that's not the whole story. When we calculate the p-value, we calculate it based on something like the t-test. We need sample size, so how many patients are in each group, and a standard deviation. And of course, the actual result. 
the effect size. The, with those three things, you can calculate any clinical trial's p-value. There's a lot of details in between, but it really, at the end of the day, is not too complicated. The more sample, the easier it is to tell the difference. The less standard deviation, in other words, how each patient does. You could have a lot of patients adding up and averaging seven with totally different values, or they can all be like 6.9, 6.8, 7.1, 7.2. So my null hypothesis is that the drug is no different, that it falls within this orange reddish color here, pink, orange, red. The alternative hypothesis is that the drug is better and it falls in the blue hypothesis. And, and this could just simply be, we're measuring the value here is zero, which is drug minus placebo in, in months of survival. If you're a patient, you wanna be all the way over here in the far end of the distribution, right? You want this number to be three or four or five or six or infinity, ideally. You wanna live much longer than placebo, drug minus placebo. If the result comes out in this area, placebo is better than the drug. So my hypothesis is the null hypothesis, which is that it won't work. What is the probability I can reject this hypothesis? Well, if the result was 25 months versus seven, I can probably, and, and the patients, there were 1,000 patients in each group, 1,000 here, 1,000 here, and all of the patients in this group had a very small difference. If you looked at each 1,000 patients, they're all like right around 25. And if you looked at these guys, they're all right around seven. The p-value of a trial like this would be what? What would it be roughly? Zero point what? You can think of it as the chance that this result was random, but it's better to think of it as what is the confidence I have of rejecting the null hypothesis. I'm very, very confident. Exactly, Michael got it right. I'm very, very, very confident. Oh yes, AML does happen with, with babies sometimes, or young kids. That's crazy. Crazy story, Will. I'm glad you're still with us. bone marrow transplant, very young, you can survive. So the p-value goes into the p-value calculator, and that's some really ridiculously low number because the chance that this was, or the likelihood that the result we just saw was due to chance is very low. And the confidence I have of rejecting the null hypothesis, which again is that these two aren't any different, well, they're as different as it gets. And it wasn't just to, due to like three patients doing well or some randomness around, okay, one guy did like 52 months or something. Now this was a really, really big difference. So we can completely reject the null hypothesis. In something like this, I don't have a lot of confidence I can reject the null hypothesis. In fact, the null hypothesis is probably true. So this is why statistics are so important in biopharma. And I would just encourage you guys to spend a couple of hours you know, on statistics, really easy. Um, thing to do, and you learn a lot. And interim analyses are all about statistics. So how does an interim analysis work? This is fun. This is really fun. In an interim analysis, so again, you have your primary endpoint. You can't change this. You have to pre-specify it. You can't decide after what the primary endpoint is. And the primary endpoint is survival, which is what it should be in cancer. It doesn't get any better than that, right? And you decide what the alpha is for your primary endpoint analysis. Remember, we're gonna do like something like a t-test at the end. Usually it's at the end, but instead we're gonna do two tests. We're gonna do one now, we're gonna do one at the end. How does this work? This violates one of the key principles of statistics called multiple corrections or multiple it's really called Bonferroni's. It's 
called multiple comparisons or other names, but it just basically means that you can't multiple hypothesis testing, whatever you want to call it. You cannot simply constantly query the data set over and over again until you find the result you want. If you change this to progression-free survival, or if you change this to patients who had I don't know, certain characteristics, like you just say women in the trial, or people older than 75, or whatever. You know, that's the way most people, most fraudulent companies do things. You have to pre-specify it, put it in the ground, and say, this is going to be the way I do it. And that's sometimes called the statistical analysis plan. You cannot change it. And Cassava did exactly that, as we saw earlier. So, how do you do two of these then? That kind of violates the key principle of, well, I'm going to do some now and I'm going to do the test again later. No, it's perfectly fine, you, but you do have to take some hit. There's no free lunch. So instead of the alpha of that 5% null hypothesis rejection all going to one look, we sometimes call these looks, we're going to do 0.01 here. And for simplicity's sake, we'll just say we're going to do 0.04 here. So for the interim analysis, the hurdle is a lot harder. We have to be able to reject the null hypothesis with extremely high amount of certainty. And I showed you the t-test calculator earlier, right? On GraphPad, and you can go to GraphPad t-test. And with the interim analysis, 0 0.01, sometimes it's even 0 0.001 or 0.05, yeah, the SAP has to be published correct, correct. And sometimes it's not published for investors. So it's really frustrating for us because we don't know what the power is. Um, so anyway, let's say it's um, mean is eight months and control is six months. Pretty good result, right? That's a 33% improvement in survival. I mean, how could that be bad? Well, We're not basing it on all 60 patients, right? We're only basing it on 60 events. So 30 and 30, the p-value here is 0 0.0577, not even enough for the full analysis alpha. So you, it would have to be really low standard deviation, really high mean. This would technically fail as well. It's above 0.01. It has to be below 0.01. So maybe it would be, I don't know, Eight and a half, two and a half, and two and a half. Finally, it's less than 0.01. So, so 0.05 is typically the threshold, but you can do an interim analysis and decide that we're going to do a partial analysis. Now, t-test is not really how you describe this kind of test. It's actually something called a Kaplan-Meier curve, which is just a survival curve. And here is perhaps chemo. Pretty much will go to zero, unfortunately. This is overall survival in months. Well, let's say, I don't know, this is six months. So this would be what, three months? And this would be like well, one, two, three, four, five, that kind of thing. Okay. Well, the hope is that drug will do something like this. You know, obviously if it can do something like this, it'd be great, but you know, that's that would be literally a cure. But chances are, you know, it's going to do something like this. We don't want it to do something like this. Now, if you know, if you went to college, you probably know what we're looking at here. This is kind of remind, reminiscent of, does anybody, anybody know? I know somebody knows. Kind of reminds me of a calculus class I once took. Does anybody know what this is called? Sound linear regression. No. Cubs, yes, maybe there is. Yeah, it's an integral. So it's the area under the curve. Exactly, Chloe. There's an area under the curve here that's higher. So if yellow is, is the draw is the control group, just chemo, the blue is almost like we add we add more. We had more um, survival 
And it's important to figure this out because one of the problems with a t-test, why do we do this? Well, there's a reason. One of the problems with the t-test is if you just look at median, for example, let's do it again. I'm so bad with my mouse. Let's do this again. And here's drug. Mosing, here's control. Mosing along. And here's drug. Well, if we just look at average or mean, if we look at mean, mean is going to be around here. And on mean, there's no difference. Average, maybe average cuts around here. But even average doesn't really explain this. This is basically like, look, most people are going to go the same way of chemo. Half the people are going to just die the same amount of chemo, right? This much is the same. There's no area under the curve change. It's imperceptible. But look at all this. Some people will do really well. And mean and median don't really pick that up that well. I like Cliff a lot. Let's focus on biopharma. We're, we're looking at this really carefully. OK, so they're saying following the predetermined statistical analysis plan. Great. OK, nothing else in here. We can skip the financials. They don't really matter. Notice how I'm not fastidiously punching in numbers in a model. 